and welcome to one and all. My name is Maureen, and I'm a member of the Kerry Diocesan Justice and Peace Group, the JPIC. There are other members here this evening as well, and you'll see them later on. And it's great to see so many of you joining us this evening. We had uh, 200 registered, so I'm hoping that they're all here at the moment. And it's great to see some familiar faces and also some unfamiliar faces, not, not familiar yet anyway. I hope you enjoyed that lovely presentation at the beginning of our session and the, the slides of the beautiful creatures we shared the earth with were courtesy of Jar Scollard from the Irish Wildlife Trust branch here in Kerry. And the music was provided by Mike Shea, who is a Trillian musician and a choir leader in St. John's Church here in Trilly as well. So as you know, we're halfway through the season of creation which began on the 1st of September and finishes on the 4th of October, the Feast of St. Francis of Assisi. And the season of creation is a time for us Christians worldwide to reflect and act in the interests of caring for our common home, the earth, which we share with all those other creatures as well. And the theme this year is restoring our common home. And we all know that there's a great urgency and much work to be done to restore nature and to, uh, worse, to limit the worsening effects of climate emergency. And here in, here in Kerry Diocese, we have chosen a specific aspect of restoring our common home, and it's caring for God's creatures. And you saw some of those lovely creatures in the first presentation there. And it's the focus of our webinar this evening. We'll have three expert panelists joining us later, and Sylvie will introduce them. But we invite you to look at your screen and find the Q&A facility, which is usually located at the bottom of your screen. And at any stage during the presentation, just feel free to type in any questions or co comments which, you, which arise for you as you listen to the speakers. And Des, who is our, our diocesan pastoral worker, will watch out for those questions and answers and he'll collate them. And then at the end, we'll take some time to address and respond to your queries and comments. But for now, let's pause and take some time for a short reflection, a special one prepared for the season of creation this year by Jane Mellett, who works with Chokra. Creator of all, we are grateful that from your communion of love, you created our planet to be a home for all. By your holy wisdom, you made the earth to bring forth a diversity of living beings that filled the soil, water and air. Each part of creation praises you in their being and cares for one another from our place in the web of life. With the psalmist, we sing your praise that in your house, even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. We remember that you call human beings to keep your garden in ways that honour the dignity of each creature and conserve their place in the abundance of life on earth. But we know that our will to power pushes the planet beyond her limits. Our consumption is out of harmony and rhythm with Earth's capacity to heal herself. Habitats are left barren or lost species are lost and systems fail. Where reefs and burrows, mountaintops and ocean deeps once teemed with life and relationships, wet and dry deserts lie empty, as if uncreated. Human families are displaced by insecurity and conflict, migrating in search of peace. Animals flee fires, deforestation and famine wandering in search of a new place to find a home to lay their young and live. In this season of creation, we pray that the breath of your creative word would move our hearts as in the waters of our birth and baptism. Give us faith to follow Christ to our just place in the beloved community. Enlighten us with the grace to respond to your covenant and call to care for our common home. In our tilling and keeping, 
gladden our hearts to know that we participate with your Holy Spirit to renew the face of your earth and safeguard a home for all. In the name of the one who came to proclaim good news to all creation, Jesus Christ, amen. job this evening. In fact, it's not a job at all. It's a privilege because I have the privilege of introducing our three speakers, our three expert presenters. And the first one is Patricia Dean. So Patricia tells me that all the farmers who work with her call her Trish. Maybe Patricia is a bit too formal and we don't want to be too formal tonight, Trish. She is working in a most amazing place as part of a partnership. The official name is the McGillicuddy Reeks European Innovation Partnership, and that word partnership is the most important word. Patricia is actually employed by the South Kerry Development Partnership, but then the money and the funding comes from the Department of Agriculture Marine and food. And indeed, a birdie told me she met the minister this morning. So she has been on the hot coals today for the whole of the day. But this is not a stressful one, we hope, Trish. And this is such a, an important part because it's part of the Rural Development Program for Ireland. Now, this afternoon, I took a tiny stroll up to have a little look at the reeks from where I can see them usually from Ballymac, but today they were hidden. They were hidden behind the cloud. But many people have walked in through the Hags Glen or into the Black Valley or driven from Milltown to Killarney and looked over at the majestic reeks, the McGillicuddy reeks. But of course, it's a place that is a habitat for many creatures, but also for creatures who are people farmers, landowners, and it needs to be preserved for all of them. So today, Trish, you're so welcome this evening. And will you tell us all about your work? It sounds so interesting. So we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you much, so much, Sylvia. That was a, an amazing introduction. I can't get away with much around the county, obviously. I know that now. <laughs> um, we have our spies I'm with, everywhere. <laughs> I'm sure of it. So I must confess now, I am not an expert. So I'm actually not an ecologist. So I'm sure we've um, far more um, expert people and expertise than me tonight. So I'm going to go straight in now to the presentation because I know we're going to be quick on time. So hopefully now everybody can see what's popping up here in the screen. So you should see our logo there, our project logo. Is everyone seeing that yet? Yeah. Okay, so there we go. We are, a, I, like Sylvia, I'm introduced to the area for South Kerry Development Partnership. And I'm here to talk to you tonight about our project that we're operating in the McGillicuddy Reeks. It's an agri-environmental project, and it's all about developing innovative actions for high nature value farming in the McGillicuddy Reeks. So that is actually a picture there, McGillicuddy Reeks. So um, I am the project manager. I work with a part-time project ecologist and a part-time administrator, and we are ably supported and assisted then by the Department of Agriculture and a number of other key partners, um, South Kerry Development Partnership, the Mountain Access Forum, the Munster Technological University, National Parks and Wildlife Service, Crowley Consultants, Local Farm Advisors, Tagish and Kerry County Council. They're all supporting us and helping us uh, work with the farmers on the ground to roll out this project. So I suppose, guys, Sylvia mentioned what the rural the EIP projects are. It's a big mouthful, um, but we're only one of these European Innovation Partnership projects. There's a number of them. And you're going to hear from two more tonight, the Pearl Muscle Project and the Curlew Conservation Project. Um, so they're locally led schemes. That's basically what they are. So this is just a, an infographic on some of them. It's been updated since because more have been added to this. So you can see there's a great diversity of work going on across the country. So I just said when I was the first speaker, I'd give a quick introduction. So there's a number of upland projects, but they're not all upland projects. And there is a range, everything from enabling conservation tillage to um, um, I think there's an architecture um, or an archaeological project as well in operation. So great diversity of things going on in the country, thank God. 
So what are we doing in the McGillicuddy Weeks? Well, I suppose everything we're trying to do is trying to improve the sustainability and the economic viability of farming in the McGillicuddy Weeks. Why are we doing this? Well, it is to all to improve the condition of habitats inside this mature 2000 area. So we'll talk a little bit more about the mature 2000 area in a minute, but it's working with the farmers that own the land. Um, so what is a habitat, guys? I don't want to take it for granted that everybody's here tonight knows what a habitat is. So habitat is a place where um, plants and animals live and grow. It should have everything that they need to survive. That doesn't always happen, okay? So what we know about the McGillicuddy Weeks is it's very challenging terrain. There's issues with climate, there's succession issues. Very few young farmers are getting involved in farming, unfortunately, in these upland areas because it's very difficult to farm this land, okay? And it's just economically unviable a lot of the times. And then, of course, there is a challenge, I suppose, in the McGillicuddy Weeks that wouldn't be found elsewhere in Ireland. And that is huge volumes of recreational um, visitors every year to visit and climb Carnthool. OK, so that's just a little bit of context to what we're doing. And we're also then trying to do what we're doing tonight. Tell everybody what we're doing. It's positive. It should be shared. We're trying to raise awareness of this SEC designation, which I'll talk about as well, a special area of conservation. OK, and it's all about protecting these species and habitats that we will find in the weeks. We don't want any further habitat damage. Um, a lot of it is due to recreational pressures, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So we're doing some trail maintenance works, and we have a landowner ranger system in place as well. So that gives you an idea there. And that isn't actually an aerial photograph, everybody. That is actually a shot that's taken from the McGillicuddy Weeks. But that now, the photograph there on the left is just probably a typical day in the McGillicuddy Weeks where people are just kind of wandering around the place. And obviously, this is having an impact on these habitats and species. Okay. So we're only working in a relatively small area with a small number of landowners. So this is our project boundary. It's part of the larger SAC, the Special Area Conservation, uh, the Clarny National Park, McGillicuddy Weeks and the Car River Catchment. So it's a huge area. So we're only working with a number of landowners because unfortunately we're only a four year project and we did not get an enormous budget. We would love to take everybody in and it was great. Um, uh, interest from the farmers and joining the project when we initiated it but unfortunately we couldn't take them all in it's a pilot it's about sharing the learnings okay and why do we think it's so important to maintain farming and um, because it is important not just you can't have um conservation and biodiversity without having local communities working on the ground and we know that that's in the um, european landscape convention and anyone who wants to read more about it there was a very good study conducted there by brendan o'keefe and caroline crowley back in 2019 um, and a, a profile of an all-earned study highlighting the strategic importance of upland areas. So if anyone wants to do a bit of reading, I would recommend that highly. So again, guys, I said I'd explain what special areas of conservation are, so I hope this makes sense to you all. So there was two pieces of legislation brought in. First came the Birds Directive way back in 1979, and that was all to protect rare, threatened and migrating birds across Europe. Much, much later then came the Habitats Directive, and in 1992, and this was looking at um, protecting rare and threatened habitats and species other than birds. OK, so all of the McGillicuddy Weeks area is a special area of conservation, except for maybe the lowland slopes, but for the majority of the upland commoners, they would be. So this is a picture taken with our farmers out doing habitat assessments and training with us. We everybody takes it for granted that the farmers should know why the land is um, a special area of conservation. They don't. Unfortunately, no one took the time to explain to them what was on the land, why it was designated in the first place, what it was designated for. So we've got a lot of work to do now to meet the farmers, walk the ground with them and explain this to them because we can't expect to care for God's creatures unless we know what's there, okay? So a lot of the farmers were aware of restrictions, you know, that they said, oh, well, we're not allowed to do things, but they weren't aware of the procedures. So again, part of our work is to be there to support the farmers and see what can be done. So a lot of it is practical support and appropriate advice. And I say that really strongly, appropriate advice and relevant training. OK, and not just to the farmers, but the people that work with them as well. And um, so, again, this is our project ecologist and she's out and um, we're showing the farmers a lot of the things that you would expect to find. Little experiments as well. This particular experiment was to show the quality of water um, in overgrazed versus undergrazed land um, and the, the, the effect it can have. So a number of these European Innovation Partnership projects, we have adopted a results-based payment system. So that's all about incentivizing the farmers. So the, the better the condition of the habitats, um, the higher the payment that they can receive, okay, at land parcel level. So we do these assessments on the ground. And it's all about 
the condition of the habitat, the landscape value, and the richness of biodiversity. But it's also about incentivizing the farmers. So if they're if they're if 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 things aren't great on the ground, which is a lot of the time they're they they aren't, um, then we can support that. We can make changes to, to kind of support the, the change that needs to be made. So guys, a lot of your kind of thinking, annex habitats. What is this? So I suppose a lot of you probably would be familiar with these um, wet heat and dry heat, maybe blank bogs. So not all of these. I think there's something like 14 in total. They're not all in the Gillipuddy Week. Some of them would be in Clarny National Park. So we would be mostly in our project looking at the wet heat, the dry heat and the blanket bog. And a lot of the lakes, I suppose, in the Gillipuddy Weeks as well would be these orotrophic waters. OK, so... Um, and we have some of the alpine and subalpine heats as well. They're very, very high, um, but they would be um, kind of, the growth would be very slow, really, because those, those dwarf shrubs, the small shrubs that you find, they'd be stunted, obviously, by the high winds and the snowfall over the winter. So that gives you an idea of what's in the reeks. But again, we need to spend time to explain this to the farmers because this hasn't gone, no one has gone through this with them previously. A long list here, some of these things you'll be familiar with. The Kerry Slug, I think he's been spoken about because he's held up some projects. Um, he's in good condition, um, thank God, in the Gilligan Weeks. He's actually found in Kerry and Cork and in some places of North Spain and Portugal. He must have gone off on his holidays there at one stage and decided it was nicer climate. But um, we have that, the freshwater pearl mussel. You need to hear more from Dr. Mary Catherine um, about the freshwater pearl mussel. So there's a whole load of different things. And people might say, well, why are these, you know, particular to the reeks even well everything that we're doing on the mountainside has an effect down the land of it okay so if there's a lot of soil erosion for example it could get sediment could get into the water courses and then this could affect um things like the freshwater pearl mussel could affect the the salmon you know so everything is connected um, so it's all about striking a balance so that's just a very very quick snapshot so i hope everybody's keeping with me um just to give you an idea so here we go. These are what our upland peatlands uh, look like. So a lot of the time there's kind of a mosaic. You could be in wet heat, you could be in dry heat. So um, there's it kind of it travels across. So there's plenty of heather. And for anyone, again, I saw I you saw beautiful photographs there at the start of some of the lovely animals that we find. And here's some of the plants and um, of the heat and bog habitat. So bilberry, bog cotton, ling heather, bell heather, cross leaf teeth. And bog asphodel. So they're the things you typically find growing on these heath and bog habitats. And again, these were shown at the very start in those beautiful photographs, the red grouse, the mountain hare, the ring ozel, common frog, and my friend the Kerry slug. Okay, so like things have to be right. The habit has to be right for these to um, survive and to live happily. Okay, and the bad news is unfortunately we're looking at a massive decline in some of these. The ring ozel is only found in Kerry and Donegal, I believe. Um, and he's in massive decline. The ring, uh, the, the red grouse is also in decline, unfortunately. And I have a figure here, I think that it's 70% decline um, in, in the last 50 years for the poor um, red grouse. Um, so we need to do a lot to, to work on these. So what are the threats? What do we see happening on the mountains? Well, we see bracken. So people say bracken, ferns. Oh, yes. Yeah. So what happens? So there you go. See it in full growth. And you see it after it's, it's, it's dried away for the winter. It is actually a, a native um, 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 fern, so it is. And it's naturally found in woodlands, but it can come into peatlands and it can shade out all of the heather and the sphagnum mosses. And this can lead to then to the loss of the bog and the heat habitats. OK, so this is a challenge for us trying to manage it. So that's one of our little challenges that we're dealing with in the upland areas, because, again, if the heat um, and the bog habitats are being disturbed by something, that means the creatures and everything that are there living it are also going to be disturbed. So what are we doing about it? Well, we're trying loads of different initiatives because you remember we are a, a European innovation. So everything has to be innovative. We have to try different things that haven't been tried before. So we're looking at dual grazing with cattle. Cattle used to be on the mountains historically with sheep years ago, and then they were taken down. And um, we, so we're trying to reintroduce them again. They do a little bit of trampling of the bracken. That can be quite effective and get rid of the bracken. We look at a robot. We brought a robot up. Um, onto the side of the mountain to cut out down some of the dense vegetation to see would that be an option could that work going forward and obviously then sometimes we have to use some herbicides to try and treat bracken in some areas uh, depending on the extent of it so there's a range of different options and each farm is totally different um, with different solutions but it's about working with the farmers to see what they can do so again here's some very high heather we know the heather is really important for an awful lot of our species like i mentioned the red grouse um, but again, that can become degenerate, it can become quite tall and woody and it can start dying away. 
it's not about getting the balance right because for things like the red grocer's wife he needs heather at different heights it can't all be uniform across the sites so um it's about just trying to strike the balance between agriculture and environment and having everybody everything work in harmony and that's really really important so where we've heather and when it's becoming quite thick and woody and um, maybe starting to die off we've actually put people in to thin it out by hand some of the farmers have been in and they've been thinning it okay now that's an extreme measure people might say but on these areas guys machinery can't come in so this is an alternative so you can see how far away the house is here from this site it's quite a trick so this is hard work okay so again, it's all about balance. And we see gorse, and this is another thing that people will hear about gorse and they hear about trying to manage gorse. But we do know, and this is another challenge that we face, accumulated vegetation feeds the wildfire. Okay. So that's something we'd be very conscious as well in trying to manage it. And um, again, it's all about supporting balance, a balanced approach to everything. So there we go again. I just, um, if anybody doubts that the sheep graze very high on the reeks, there we go. That's the cross there on Karen Thul, uh, behind those two sheep. So it's, it is about balance. Um, so dual grazing was the thing that was done. Um, and we're looking at doing it again because the cattle are very good. And um, not just for tramping bracken, but they also chew down on the phenon. The farmers call it locally, but it would be also known as purple moorgrass um, or millennia. Okay. So everything is kind of interconnected. And that's what I keep saying the whole time. Um, and a lot of these have not been done for years. So it's trying different things. But we know hard work must be rewarded. And that is a challenge in its own way. Because I mentioned succession issues at the start. We don't have a lot of young farmers coming in. You can see here from these photographs, two guys taking an IBC tank up there so they have water for the cattle. Um, feeding the, the sheep even, you know, when the snow comes down, the snow can come at different times. There's a little ramp pump um, that my brother actually made for the project um, to actually get water supply to these areas where there isn't any water. So it's all about trying um, different approaches and seeing what works, okay, and working with the farmers. Now, this is a very controversial one. Rhododendron pontigan, people tell us, oh, it's a beautiful flower. Unfortunately, it's an invasive species, so it might be very pretty, but it's actually uh, toxic to livestock, but it can also completely invade habitats and it can smother all the native vegetation out. So rhododendron people might be aware of it in the Kearney National Park, but it's also encroaching into the McGillicuddy Weeks. So it's a big challenge for us. So what are we doing about it? Well, unfortunately, we it is very time consuming, but we're trying to get people to work together. So it's getting the farmers and the policymakers to work together. And we're what we're doing in a big part of our project is we're getting local people involved. We want to build the skills locally of how to do this and how to do this in the right way, how to treat these things in the right way. And um, so if anybody ever wants to find out more about Rhododendron and Pontican, we're doing workshops at the moment uh, for anyone. And I put up our contact details at the end. There's also a very good guide to managing Rhododendron and Pontican uh, written by uh, Dr. Therese Higgins. Um, so that's just an aside, but there's a group of our guys, these are local people, sometimes they're local farmers, off-farm employment, so there's a social side to this work that they're doing, and they're working together, and obviously as we'd say in Kerry, there's great crack, okay, so it's a very sustainable model, um, and again, it's very limiting in the terms of any environmental damage that it has, so it's all about training, which is really important, and I'll mention that again in a minute, so because we need to, to look after everything in harmony. So that gives you an idea of what the rhododendron looks like when it's cut, when it's dead, and then how are we disposing of it? Again, just something very different. We didn't want to burn directly on the ground, so we built this frame, um, and we burn on top of the frame all that dead brush, because if we left it there, it could actually be a source of fire if anybody dropped it. It's very, uh, it burns very, very hot rhododendron when it's, it's, it's dead. So again, it's about uh, managing that so it doesn't become an issue down the road. And if you left dead brush um, on a, a piled as well, you could get new growth coming in underneath it. So again, we're looking at everything in a holistic uh, viewpoint the whole time. So again, guys, and I've said it before, it's all about you know bringing the farmers along, talking, you know, having workshops, having training. It's so important, and they're, that they're listened to, um, because every single farm is different, and the challenges are different. So we do a lot of workshops as well with other upland areas. And just sharing our experiences um, and dr mary catherine has been very good to us so she has she always takes the call with the irritating queries so guys i mentioned this at the start as well the impact of recreation 
and the habitats. So in the photographs there, you can see where people have been walking to the left and right of the main tracks. They don't want to walk with their boots through the middle because uh, they might get a bit of water, you know, and the blue stone. So this is what it looked like before we did any of our path restoration works. So what we're doing under this project is um, the restoration and the maintenance of the tracks that have been restored. And it's not just the McGillicuddy Reeks, I suppose, that this is happening. Um, this would be happening up and down the country. So just to give you a bit of context, um, this is um, um, a few different areas in Ireland um, that you can see there, Errigal and Donegal, you know. Um, so that's it's a pity to see it. And, and a lot of that is down to ourselves. So we'd be trying to encourage people to stay in the middle of the path, don't walk to the edge of the path, walk through the middle. Crowpatrick does work undergoing there at the moment, trying to do restoration there, which is very difficult, very busy mountain as well. And then uh, Lugga in uh, Lugga in Wicklow. So um, everything is having an impact on everything else. But we know that the, the solutions need to be tailored to the challenges of the area. So again, I'll show you some before and after. So this is the exact same section um, leading up from uh, Cronin's Yard as you head up. So there were the guys working in horrendous conditions trying to do path restoration works. And the other photographs then are taken, the bottom series of photographs are taken from Brain Lee or the Hydro Road. So this was before we carried out any work, during the works and then afterwards. Okay, so it's about balance. Um, so I suppose, what do we talk to people about? Now, guys, if anyone is of a nervous disposition, you might want to look away. So unfortunately, about respect. Respect is really important. And unfortunately, a lot of people aren't aware that the Miguelity Reeks are privately owned um, and that they are actively used as, as farms. There might be big, unclosed areas, but we need to respect. And we have been challenged recently and, and for a long time now with people bringing their dogs um, leaving dogs off leads, the dogs ch chasing sheep, and, and it's very, very upsetting. So we found out when we were doing survey work, you know, as part of our landowner range initiative, huge proportion of the walkers, this was last year's figure, 82% of people didn't know that the reeks are privately owned. Um, and they weren't aware either, 86% weren't aware that there was any protected species or habitats from the reeks. So we have a lot of work to do with the public. And just to raise awareness, really, of what is on the ground and why it needs to be protected. Um, so that gives you a little bit of a, uh, what's going on. So we do a lot of work as well with our schools and our universities and our colleges. And um, we get visitors from everywhere and we go into the schools and it's great to get young people engaged. And then also, not just young people, um, we're trying to work. I think that was a, a screenshot there from one of the online uh, presentations that we participated in with the CAP. So CAP has been written at the moment. So again, we're just trying to look at what going forward do we need to do to change things. So it's a lot about sharing what we're doing and hoping that there's a future for our young people in these areas. Um, and I think the middle photograph there is a picture of my niece actually inside the middle of the lambs when the lambs were um, being born last year. So again, guys, um, I come to the end of the presentation. I hope I haven't gone too fast through it or too slow. <laughs> I don't think I have. I suppose there is great opportunities if we work together. It shouldn't be a, nurse, a, a, a us versus them approach. So anybody who wants to find out more, I'm contactable at all times. Um, we have a Facebook page and a website, McGillicuddyReeksCarry.com, big mouthful, um, or follow us on Facebook. So guys, I think it's very important we all listen to each other. And um, thank you very, very much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you all tonight. Thanks a million. I'm a little bit breathless, but what work, what important, important work. And it just kept reminding me of what Pope Francis says, that everything is connected. And so the next time, if you're thinking of going in to walk in Karen Tool, you'll be mindful. You won't take a dog or take a dog without a lead. And you'll be respectful of the people who are working there in all sorts of conditions. So Patricia, thank you for taking on this journey. We could have had you for the whole night, but we're moving on. But stay with us. Don't disappear because we have some questions and answers later. And now I've got a very other wonderful speaker. She didn't think she was a, an expert, but it seemed to me she was fairly expert. But look who we have now. We have Hubert Servigny. That's me. And he's a French native, but living in Kerry for 20 years. I don't know if he has a Kerry accent yet. I'm working on mine. So Uber, you're very, very welcome. And he is someone who describes himself as someone who was passionate about birds since he was a child. And in his background, 
he surveyed both the peregrine falcon and indeed the hen harrier. And this year, we know, and maybe for, he'll tell us more about the curlew conservation program. Because this is, we know the curlew is another endangered species, but it's not my job. Hubert, the floor is yours and the screen. Thank you so much for coming to us this evening. Thanks very much, Sylvia. And thanks, Trish, for a gorgeous presentation. Um, just for one second, I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, I hope everybody sees this. And I'm just going to play a little clip. Um, I don't know if everybody heard that. Uh, it's a sound that's uh, very familiar to a lot of people, um, especially if you walk the coast of, say, Blenavale or the mudflats outside Kersivin in the in the winter. The sound of the curlew. Uh, so I'm going to just uh, spend a few minutes here to talk to you about the Curlew Conservation Program. Uh, it's a National Parks and Wildlife Service uh, program that has started uh, in, back in 2017 and which uh, is trying to uh, halt uh, the steep, steep decline of breeding curlew in, in Ireland. So if I said that the sound and the sight of the curlew would be familiar to anyone who walked the, the coastline in the winter, uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the curlew has almost disappeared now or is disappearing fast anyway from our, our countryside in the, in the summer. And anyone that has, um, say, worked in the bog uh, back in the long summer days of, of uh, a long time ago would remember the, the call of the curlew. And uh, unfortunately, uh, we're down to um, a little under 200 pairs now breeding in Ireland. And it's thought to be down from something uh, in the region of three and a half to 5,000 uh, back in the 80s. So you see that the, the decline is extremely sharp and, uh, and steep and, and sudden. Um, so I said it, it, the, the, the program is, is led by the National Parks and Wildlife Service. The, it, it was started because uh, there was a survey back in 2015, 2016 that established the, the gravity of the decline of, of breeding curlew in Ireland. And uh, the program was, was put in place then. If, I, if I'm talking about the, the program tonight, I want also to state that I'm, I'm not speaking on behalf of the National Parks and Wildlife Service. I'm just presenting uh, uh, the, the Curlew Conservation Program. And if I express any, any opinions, there'll be my own opinions. Um, I, I think we can say that the, the fate of the Curlew is kind of a cautionary tale about us and our, our modern life and what, what we do with what God has created with this earth, with this planet. And I'm not here to cast any judgments or, or say what we should do or what we should not do, but uh, uh, we, we live in a world that uh, moves very fast. And um, the, the, the decline of the curlew really echoes uh, that, that, that speed uh, with which the, our world is changing. And mostly the decline of the curlew is um, due to something that Trish mentioned very much so, which is uh, loss of habitat, uh, degradation of habitat. For curlew, it's mostly also fragmentation of habitat. Uh, curlew typically breed in vast bogs, vast uh, upland uh, bogs, uh, which used to be extremely common uh, up until maybe 30 years ago. And now if you go to the Stax Mountains, if you go to some parts of Leitrim, if you go to some parts of Donegal, you'll see that uh, a lot of land has been reclaimed uh, for sheep, for cattle. Uh, there's a lot of uh, afforestation going on as well. And uh, the consequences of, of that are that we, we are losing some, some species. So we we'll probably gain some species because those habitats are more fav favorable to other species, but certainly with uh, species like curlew, which need a very specific type of habitat, they are declining at a, at a rate that's 
uh, absolutely alarming. Um, the, the, the curlew is actually the only bird uh, in Ireland that's on uh, what's called the red list of the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. So that should tell you how uh, grave the, the, the situation is. And I'll just, in a, in a, in a few words, I'll, I'll just say what the Curlew Conservation Program does. So exactly like Trish has, has described with, with her own project, we are very much a, a local based uh, program. We uh, have nine local teams uh, across Ireland. So we have one here in the Stax Mountains, east of Tralee. We are present in uh, Vishkilde. We are in the Octis, in uh, uh, Clare Galway, uh, around Lochry, uh, between Roscommon and, and Westmead. We're in Loch Corrib, um, and also further north uh, towards Mayo, Leitrim, Donegal, and then back to uh, Monan. So we're trying to work with uh, local people, landowners, farmers, uh, very reminiscent of what Trish was, what was talking about, to try and uh, find the, the last remaining pairs of, of curlew and help them as, as best we can. And I suppose the, the program is very much centered on what we can offer to landowners and farmers to help them and so that they help curlew as well. And, and it can be about habitat restoration. It can be about uh, removal of some, uh, some, some tree line, et cetera, et cetera. So we are very closely and habitats are very uh, diverse. And so we, we have very diverse uh, needs and, and ways of intervening as well with, with that. And with that, we also offer, uh, as best as we can, uh, nest protection work. So whenever we find uh, nests, we uh, sometimes fence them to protect them against uh, ground predators, mostly uh, foxes and, and, and badgers. And uh, that, uh, that, that's kind of the, the bulk of the, of the program. Uh, it, it, a lot of it is, is focused on survey and, and trying to establish where the, the curlews are, but also trying to help them practically uh, raise their young. Uh, we have found that predation is, it has become a big problem in a, in a very poor habitat, in a very fragmented habitat. And um, the reason why the populations don't really renew themselves is because they're aging and they are not reproducing themselves at a, at a rate that, uh, that, that's fast enough. And there, there's a lot of uh, loss of eggs and chicks through, through predation. And this is probably due to the fact that the, the new habitat that we've created in the past 30 years, 40 years, is probably more uh, favorable to what we call general species. So they're the, the, the species that you see on the daily basis. They're the hooded crows, rooks, jackdaws, magpies, foxes, badgers, which you know are, are all fairly fairly common, which can thrive on 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 th those kind of um, uh, traditional farmlands as we as we find them now but this is to detriment of, uh, of a lot of species uh, the curlew is only one then the hen harrier would be one another one uh, snipe red grouse and uh, hare like the the list is quite uh, quite long so i'm i'm very honored to be uh, part of the this program i'm actually the the project manager with the curly conservation program and I suppose for us, like the, the, the breeding season uh, happens mostly between March and, uh, and July. And we, we are very grateful to the public for, for the help they're providing. We, we found that there's a lot of knowledge about the local uh, habitats and local areas. So we work very closely with, with, with people and uh, I would urge uh, back next March, April, if, if people uh, hear curlew or see curlew in their localities, in their plans, uh, especially around here in, in the in the stacks, to, uh, to to get in touch with us and to help us find and hopefully save uh, those uh, those last curlew. This uh, concludes my presentation. Thank you so much for your attention, uh, and I'll bring the floor back to you, Sylvia. Thank you. Thank you, Hubert. And the thought that we would lose that sound is really just, it's so sad, even though, of course, we have visiting ones and we're happy to have visitors, but we'd love to be able to keep our Irish ones Absolutely. and for them to increase. Yeah. So, you know, Pope Francis uses the word our common home. 
he could have used the word our common habitat, it sounded a bit different, but let's try to have a habitat that is fit for all of the creatures, including ourselves. Yes. So thank you, Hubert. Thank you. And thank us for later. Thanks. And so now I'm delighted to welcome our third speaker, Dr. Mary Catherine Gallagher. She tells me she's living in Kinmare now. Mary Catherine is certainly interested in water and all that moves and lives in water. She was studying marine water, so salt water, for her undergraduate, graduate and postdoctorate, and then working in Fota, that place that many people love. But now here she is in fresh water over in the catchment area that includes places like Glen Carr, the Carrow River and the Black Water, working with this pearl mussel project. We might say, well, what on earth is this pearl mussel? Now, she's going to tell us, so I don't have to try to tell you. And what's so important about it anyway? You know, is it an indicator of something? I think she's going to tell us all about that too. So Dr. Mary Catherine Gallagher, who's an ecologist, we're delighted to welcome you. We've heard about you already from the people who have spoken ahead of you. So welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi Sylvia, thanks so much for the introduction and um, thanks to the other speakers for their lovely presentation so far. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen here and um, we will get talking about the freshwater pearl mussel. So um, a lot of people may have heard about the freshwater pearl mussel, but not to know too much about it. So hopefully tonight's talk will um, make people a little bit more aware about these uh, really unusual and uh, unique animals. So if someone asked you what a freshwater pearl mussel is, you could say that it was an invertebrate bivalve mollusk. And that sounds a little bit complicated, but what that really means is that it's an animal without a backbone with a soft body that's protected inside two hard shells. So you can see a picture of one here. And as the name suggests, you only find them in freshwater habitats. So they live in rivers, streams, and even some lakes as well. And freshwater pearl mussel are incredibly long lived animals. They can survive to be over 120 years of age making them one of Ireland's longest living animals. And one of the other very important things about these um, animals is that they're very sensitive to their environmental conditions. So you'll only find them living in very, very clean water. And if your population of pearl mussel in a specific river or stream or catchment begins to decline, that's one of the very first indicators that there's a problem with the water quality in that area. So they can be called an indicator species because of that. Freshwater pearl mussels spend all of their lives basically in the same place. They're sitting on the bottom of the river or stream, sort of nestled in between the stones and cobbles on the, on the bed of the river. And this might seem like a very boring existence to you and me, but actually, while they're there on the riverbed, they're carrying out a really important job, a really important role. They're filtering the water. So you can see here the, mussel in the mussels in the riverbed, and you might just see two openings in between the two shells. These two openings are called siphons. And if you imagine, they're just like two straws. So the mussel will inhale or suck water in through one of these siphons. It filters or sieves the water and it sends any food particles it wants to eat to its stomach. And then any excess water, any, face, uh, any waste gets sent out the other siphon back out into the river. And the mussel is just doing this all day. And a single mussel can actually filter up to 50 litres of water in a single day which is an inc incredible amount of water for such a sort of relatively small animal. And just to give you an idea of why this is important, if you look at these two tanks here, you'll see that the one on the right has filter feeders inside it. Now they're not freshwater pearl mussels, but they're another animal that feeds in the exact same way. And the one on the left doesn't have any filter feeders. And you can see there's a massive difference between the 
coloration and the quality of the water in the two tanks. So the freshwater pearl mussels are carrying out this really important job. And it's important not just for all of the other animals and plants that are living in our water courses because they're creating good, uh, clean conditions for them to live in. But it's also important for us as humans because we get our drinking water from rivers and streams. And even though our drinking water goes through um, water treatment plants, the freshwater pearl mussel is actually able to filter very, very small bacteria and viruses, um, which is really important. And it can sort of add an extra level to the the level of cleanliness that our water can have. So they're really important species and a lot of other species actually rely on them as well. Now, the life cycle of the freshwater pearl mussel is a little bit complicated, but it's very interesting. It has a number of different stages to it. And one of the really unique things about the pearl mussel life cycle is that the mussel relies on a fish, a salmon or a trout to be able to complete its life cycle completely. So the life cycle starts off with the adult mussels. The female mussel broods or protects the young mussel larvae inside in her shells. And when these little mussel larvae are large enough to be released into the water, she just releases them all out. And the, a single female mussel can release up to 4 million mussel larvae in a single summer. That sounds like an awful lot, but the reason they produce so many is that only very, very few survive. So the mortality rate of those larvae is actually 99.99%. These small little larvae look just like the adult mussels, like a miniature replica of them. But instead of having their shells closed, their shells are open and they're just sort of floating there in the water. To move on to the next stage of the life cycle, these little larvae, they're also called clachidia, need to grab onto the gills of a salmon or trout. So as they're floating in the water, they're hoping to come in contact with a fish that's passing along. And as the fish is moving through the water, it's taking water in and it's passing over its gills. If the clachidia senses that a fish is nearby, it starts opening and shutting its shells. It's called snapping. And if it's lucky enough to be inhaled by the fish and to pass over the fish's gills, it snaps its shells shut and grabs hold to the fish's gills. It will stay there for nine months. The fish gills are a lovely, safe and oxygen rich place for the larvae to, to live. And anywhere the fish goes, the mussel obviously goes as well. It's just like hitching a ride with the fish. After nine months, the little larvae is large enough to let go of the fish gill and drop down onto the riverbed. And it all depends on where that fish happens to be at the moment that the mussel decides to let go, whether or not the little mussel will survive onto the next stage or not. If the mussel lands in a place that isn't a suitable habitat for the mussel, it won't survive to become an adult. And what it needs for the environment to be suitable is it needs a very, very clean and well oxygenated riverbed. So lots of oxygen, especially in the top layers of the riverbed. It doesn't want too much silt or sediment or algae in the riverbed and clogging up the spaces in between the sediment. And it also needs clean water um, above the riverbed as well. So if all of those conditions are right, the little mussel will bury itself down into the riverbed. It doesn't stay on top of the riverbed because it's so small it would actually get washed away. So it buries down and it actually stays there for five years. And during those five years, it's growing and getting bigger and getting stronger. And once it's big enough, it pushes itself back up through the sediment and it emerges out into the riverbed with all the other adult mussels and it starts its life as an adult mussel. So that's the life cycle. Um, unfortunately, freshwater pearl mussel are classified as being critically endangered in Europe. And as you'll see here, that's just one step away from being extinct in the wild. So these unique animals are under serious threat. Uh, in Ireland at the moment, their conservation status is um, classified as bad and declining. So things aren't looking great for this species in Ireland right now. Despite all of that, our populations in Ireland are actually recognised 
as being of international importance. The pearl mussel used to be quite widespread all across Europe, but it's undergone massive declines over the majority of Europe. And even though our populations are declining, there are some of the best that are left in Europe. So we actually have just under half of the European population of freshwater pearl mussel here. And the numbers sound really large. So it was estimated that there was just under 11 million pearl mussels in Ireland in 2013. But that number represented a decline of 8% since a survey just six years before that. So the decline is very rapid, just like with the pearl you, like you heard about earlier. So in Ireland, we have what's called the top eight freshwater pearl mussel catchments. So these have been identified as being the very best catchments for freshwater pearl mussel that remain in Ireland and the catchments that have the best chance of restoration back to being sustainable populations. And you'll see that three of them are in Kerry. So the Kerry Blackwater catchment, the Carr catchment near the Reeks, like you heard from Tricia earlier, and the Caron catchment as well. And together, these eight catchments represent 80% of our Irish pearl mussels. Um, and even though they're the best that we have left in Ireland, they're still undergoing a decline. And ultimately, they face extinction unless action is taken to improve things for this species. So why are they in so much trouble? Why are they declining so rapidly? The main problem is that those habitat conditions that I mentioned earlier just aren't there for the juvenile mussels to survive. Unfortunately, our waters just aren't clean enough, our riverbeds are blocked up with sediment and silt and algae, and there's not enough oxygen there either. So what we're seeing is instead of this picture here, which would represent a healthy population of pearl mussels with a range of sizes from very small all the way up to very large, we're seeing populations where just the larger, older mussels are present, what you might call an aging population. And no juvenile or young mussels are surviving and coming up through to replace the older mussels as they die. So unfortunately, these populations we have today just aren't sustainable. So the Pearl Mussel Project that I'm working with is um, just like Trish, uh, Trisha mentioned earlier, it's an EIP, a European Innovation Partnership Project. So it's funded through the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. And it started in 2019 and it's going to run until 2023. And we're working with farmers in those top eight catchments that I spoke about earlier, um, working with the farmers to try and improve the habitat conditions and the environmental conditions for the freshwater pearl mussel. So like we've heard already, everything is connected. So what's happening on the land directly impacts the water quality of the rivers and streams in that catchment. So this project, in, it's also results-based, just like the Reeks EIP. It represents some additional income for farmers. And the better the environmental quality or the habitat quality that the farmers are producing, the higher the payment they get. So it's kind of a change in perspective in a way, I suppose, or a different way of looking at things. I guess traditionally farmers are used to knowing the value that their livestock or their um, milk or their crops would have at market. But we're trying to sort of introduce the concept that, well, actually the, the biodiversity and the habitats that you have and that you're producing and managing and maintaining on your land also have a value um, and they're really important as well. And as well as hopefully um, creating better conditions for the freshwater pearl mussel, there's also a lot of add-on benefits to this results-based approach as well, in that it promotes biodiversity, promotes carbon storage, protecting soil, um, natural flood management, and sort of maintaining and promoting the aesthetic value and the recreational value of these catchment areas as well. Um, so... That's basically it. Um, just a quick overview. Um, if you're interested in learning more, you can look at our website. It's pearlmuscleproject.ie. Um, we have a lot of educational resources on there um, aimed at, some are sort of specifically aimed at children. If you have kids that you think would be interested in learning more about the pearl mussel. Um, and there's also just sort of general resources there as well for, for anyone to look at. So thank you so much for having me. An incredible story that this pearl mussel is showing us. And again, the story of habitat, the theme of restoring our common home, 
we could again have listened for longer and longer and longer. So maybe over to you, Patricia. I'm wondering if there's a common edge, or do farmers own their own um, their own farm portion up in the McGill Greeks? Okay, so it's probably the same throughout the country. There's various different situations, but for the majority of the time, the upland areas are owned as common edges. So what that means is they're still privately owned. They're just shared between a number of landowners. So they can have different percentages of land that they own. Um, and obviously they're not fenced off areas or anything like that. So they're wide open. So it's all shared, shared land, basically. Now they can have tubberty rights and they can have grazing rights. Um, so there's loads of different little uh, little individualities going on with the upland areas. They're not straightforward, but that would be the case for the majority of the upland areas in Ireland. They would be all commonages, so just shared between a number of landowners. Yeah, hopefully okay. that was the question. Thanks, Patricia. Now over to you, Huber. Uh, Huber. Uh, are the number of curlews still decreasing, and how long would it take for the numbers to increase uh, with conservation? Uh, the, I think thanks to our efforts, mostly uh, the, the numbers are kind of stabilizing and there's probably still a slight decrease still but we we, we think we've, we've kind of halted the the main decline um the, the, i'm afraid um i'm again speaking just kind of i'm not I, I can't read into the future but i'm afraid that the populations won't recover unless drastic change happens and unless habitats are being restored which is not really the way it, it's going at the moment but um you know they, they they need a very specific type of habitat to 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 thrive, and they're not just finding that habitat at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Hoover. Uh, and now over to um, Dr. Mary Catherine. This is more just a comment about your 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 presentation. Uh, this is such an amazing presentation. We need to get the message out there about the wonderful humble pearl mussel. We can't allow them to disappear. Thank you for making me aware of the pearl mussel. So I think I leave it at that. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> So thank you very much to uh, all of you, to Patricia, uh, Trish, and you there, and Mary Catherine for your wonderful presentations. A lot of great work is being done and you're in the thick of it. So on behalf of everybody here, thank you for all your efforts, hard work, well done. And thank you as well to uh, Sylvia and Des for their part in this evening's presentation. And uh, there's a, a person in the background who's very seldom seen on the screen, but he's an invaluable member of our group and he's kept the show on the road tonight. And that's Ger Godley, our expert technical support. So thank you very much, Ger, for making sure that everything went well. And we're sorry that we're kind of running a little bit over time, but um, it's just that we need to uh, we speak about one more item before we finish, and that is uh, a call to action. And the call to action is because there are two very big events coming up uh, in our world, the United Nations Conference on Biodiversity and the United Nations Conference on Climate Change. And there's a petition at the moment, it is, here it is on screen, healthy planet, healthy people, and healthy creatures too. And what is happening is the, uh, the Laudato Si movement, as, as, and it's this Catholic petition as well, it's actually asking people to sign a petition which will be brought to the leaders as they meet in Glasgow uh, on climate change in November. And then also to the biodiversity mm -hmm. conference, which is only virtual at the moment uh, this, this year, but next year they're going to meet face to face in China. So there are two very important issues, biodiversity, the climate emergency, and people on the ground are needed to actually put their name to a petition which Pope Francis will draw attention to when he visits the world leaders in Glasgow. And you'll see there on the screen a minute ago, but anyway, it's called the catholicpetition.org. So we're asking you to sign that petition and also to um, ask your family and friends and put it on social media. And we're asking you to, uh, maybe in the parish, you might also uh, encourage people to sign the petition because we're trying to reach 10,000 from Ireland to join the, the thousands around the world and have a few million by the time the end of October comes. So we're asking you as well to leave no one behind as part of what we're asking the governments to do, to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius and emergency uh, mode, not just business as usual uh, and dealing with biodiversity crisis and the climate. And to protect the human rights of all people 
in their in their actions and decisions in, to uh, in, to solve the problems we have. That human rights and uh, respect for the environment are important. So we're going to finish with. Uh, okay, thank you all for being with us as well. I forgot to thank you all. I can't see you at the moment, but I know that some of you are still with us. And thank you for you being being with us. It has meant a lot. Or a meaning of our and we're finishing now with a very well-known song. And it's, you often heard um, Liam Clancy and Tommy Makem singing it. But here tonight we have Barley Corn, a group that was very popular in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s, singing, All God's Creatures Got a Place in the Fire. So, good night and thank you very much to everybody. All God's Creatures Got a Place in the Fire. Some sing low and some sing higher. Some sing out loud on the telephone wire. Some just clap their hands and pause. Or anything they got now. Listen to the bass, it's the one on the bottom where the bullfrog croaks and the hippopotamus moans and groans for the big to do. The old cow just goes moo. Cats and the dogs, they take up the middle where the honeybee hums and the cricket fiddles, the donkey brays and the pony neighs, the old gray badger sighs. All God's creatures got a place in the choir. Some sing low and some sing higher. Some sing out loud on the telephone wire. Some just clap their hands or paws or anything they got now. With the little birds singing and the melodies and the high notes ringing, the hoot owl cries over everything. The blackbird disagrees, singing in the nighttime, singing in the day. The little duck quacks and he's on his way. The otter hasn't got much to say. The porcupine talks to himself. All dark creatures got a place in the choir. Some sing low and some sing higher. Some sing out loud on the telephone wire. Some just clap their hands or paws or anything they got now. It's a simple song, a living song everywhere By the ox and the fox and the grizzly bear The grumpy alligator and the hawk of both The sly old weasel and the turtle dove All God's creatures got a place in the choir Some sing low and some sing higher Some sing out loud on the telephone wire